Hello, I'm Roger Mudd. Welcome to the History Channel. The DuPonts are more than a family. They're in their third century as an American dynasty. DuPont gunpowder and explosives helped win wars. Their synthetics revolutionized the world of fashion. Our program traces the ups and downs of this remarkable family through financial panics, feuds, and tragic accidents. Despite many setbacks and long after other family empires have crumbled, the DuPonts retain their place as American corporate aristocrats. Join us now as the History Channel presents Empires of Industry, the DuPont Dynasty. DuPont, a dynasty of wealth and power dating back to the French aristocracy of King Louis XVI. A dynasty born of explosive black powder. DuPont powder has affected history since the first shots of 1812. Their explosives powered the manifest destiny of a country blasting its way across a continent. This deadly powder enabled the family to amass one of the greatest fortunes in American history. But at what cost was that fortune earned? The ledgers of profit and loss have no column for the ultimate sacrifice made by generations of workers. What began as a simple gunpowder mill on Delaware's Brandywine Creek is today the largest chemical company in the world valued at more than 50 billion dollars the DuPont company has over 94,000 employees in 70 countries still for more than a century and a half DuPont was a family business but because the success of that business has been so closely tied to war the family has had to contend with the slings and arrows of public opinion it inevitably got them tagged with that terrible uh, reputation of being the merchants of death and that of course is inevitable uh, for anybody that is going to be in the munitions business at a in, in a time of war the anti-war lobby uh, is always accusing those who participate in wars of, uh, of doing a terrible thing and that includes the people making the powder that makes the shells that uh, that go in the guns but the fact is that uh, I think everybody's pretty glad uh, that we won World War II, uh, that uh, Nazi Germany did not, so it was in a good cause. The family traces its origins to France, where Pierre Samuel Dupont de Nemours was a confidant of King Louis XVI. The aristocratic family had many distinguished visitors to their home, including two who would lay the groundwork for the formation of the DuPont Company. One was the American minister to France, Thomas Jefferson. The other was Antoine Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry. He was instrumental in the development of black powder and gunpowder, and in fact uh, was the official uh, agent in charge of the French government's uh, munitions operations. In the late 1700s, French gunpowder was the best in the world. As Lavoisier's apprentice, DuPont's teenage son, Eleuther Irene, learned every nuance of its manufacture. Unfortunately, Irene's blossoming career as a chemist was severed by the guillotine when Lavoisier was executed during the French Revolution's reign of terror. Pressed for options in a country that seemed to offer none, Pierre Samuel DuPont looked across the ocean to a land that seemed filled with opportunities. In October of 1799, the DuPont family set sail on the American Eagle. The ship was overcrowded, undersupplied, and poorly managed. Scheduled to take a month, the journey instead lasted 91 days. They had a, a difficult trip and a ship that had been condemned because it wasn't seaworthy, and they were eating rats and uh, 
had to fight with swords to keep the crew out of their food supplies. The American Eagle finally reached Newport, Rhode Island on New Year's Day, 1800. But as their voyage had been unpredictable, so too would be their journey to success. There are a number of incidents that led the DuPonts to manufacture gunpowder. One is that uh, Eleuther Irene was out hunting with a Colonel Townsend, and they saw that the quality of the powder was all over the map and, and uh, not very reliable by any means. And Irene thought to himself, we need some good, uh, reliable powder manufactured in this country. Not long after their arrival in America, Pierre Samuel visited his old friend and now President of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. President Jefferson was not enthusiastic about any of their plans until Pierre Samuel mentioned that his youngest son, Irene, had made gunpowder with the famous French chemist, Lavoisier. And with that, Jefferson sat straight up in his chair and says, he can make gunpowder? Oh yes, very good gunpowder. Well, my lord, he ought to make gunpowder. Jefferson promised the DuPonts that the federal government would be their first customer. The DuPont Mills opened in 1802, a year before the United States doubled its size with the Louisiana Purchase. Suddenly you had a new group of people moving out of the coastal cities of Charleston and Philadelphia and Boston and heading out to the wilds of Kentucky or further yet the wilds of Missouri and they were going to need gunpowder. Irene selected Delaware's Brandywine Creek as the ideal location for the new mills. It was directly between the outgoing federal capital of Philadelphia and the new capital being built in Washington. More important than location was energy. In the early days of the Industrial Revolution, water power was our main source of power. The Brandywine River falls 124 feet in the last five miles, and it's that falling water that gives you the power that's necessary to run the mills. Now, with a prime location and Lavoisier's knowledge of running the mills, the DuPont dynasty was poised to begin its rise to success. Gunpowder is a very simple recipe. There are three ingredients, charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter. And you mix the three together in the right proportions. The uh, row wheels actually weigh eight to 10 tons a piece. And what they do is they crush the three ingredients and behind each row wheel there is a plow, which plows the in three ingredients over, mixing it. The next time the row wheel comes around, it will crush it some more. And you put a spark to it or heat it up to 451 degrees and it goes right off. Knowing that explosions were inevitable, Irene made two innovations in his mill design. First, rather than constructing a single large building, he built smaller mills and spaced them apart. This way, an explosion in one mill wouldn't necessarily reach the rest of the works. The other feature was that it would be a heavy stone structure on three sides with the fourth side being a very light metal or wood covering facing over the creek so that if an explosion occurred, all of the energy of the explosion would be directed upwards or outwards across the creek. When anybody was killed, rather than say they were killed or they died or anything like that, they used to say they went across the creek. So if Joe were working in the, in the roll mill, and something happened, they would use that expression, Joe went across the creek today. And uh, literally, in many cases, they did. On March 19th, 1818, the gallows humor of crossing the creek became a frightening reality. Several men were working in a glazing mill where they polished and smoothed powder grains when a spark set off an explosion that instantly killed the workers and destroyed the building. The detonation was such that in Wilmington, people ran from their houses thinking a riverboat had exploded. 
Irene's wife, Sophie, rushed through their home to check on their newborn baby. When a second explosion ripped through the mill yards and she was slammed to the floor by flying debris. Panic-stricken workers and family members raced along the Brandywine to assess the damage. The sky was filled with black smoke and the smell of burnt flesh. Burning embers wafted up the hillside, reaching the Grand Magazine. Stone encased, it was where all the gunpowder was stored. When it caught fire and erupted, the ground shook like an earthquake. Waves began to churn down the Brandywine. The homes of the workers more than half a mile away were completely destroyed. In all, more than 30 tons of black powder had erupted. It was one of the largest man-made explosions the Earth had ever seen. The magnitude of the blast was measured not in money or property, but in the deaths of 34 workers, only eight of whose remains were identifiable. It absolutely flattened the entire powder works. They were out of business. At the age of 46, Eleutheri René Dupont's business was destroyed. He owed a mountain of debt, and the blood of 34 workers stained his hands. When we return, in the wake of devastation, Irene attempts to rebuild the shattered Dupont dynasty. Empires of Industry will continue in a moment on the History Channel.